Traguna, Macoides, Tracorum, Satis D. Oh my god, hey! Welcome back to my stagey YouTube channel. If you're seeing my face for the first time, my name is Mickey Joe and I am obsessed with all things theatre. And I am very excited because today I'm going to talk to you all about the new stage adaptation of the musical Bedknobs and Broomsticks. I got to see this a few weeks ago. It's very recently started a national tour, brand new stage adaptation of the 1969 musical. Very exciting. I went to go and see it on its second tour stop in Canterbury, and I'm going to tell you what I thought. So just as a disclaimer, I am a big fan of this film. I watched it in childhood. We had it recorded from the Disney Channel onto VHS. I don't think I remembered how much I loved this film until they were halfway through the show and specifically they sang the song The Age of Not Believing and from that point onwards I was just, I could have cried the entire time and I did and I will talk more about that in just a moment. So I would give this a very high praise four star review. Now it's a show that really won my heart. I absolutely fell in love with it. That does not make it a five star review automatically. It means I loved it but I can still recognize that in terms of the stage production, there's a couple little tweaks and changes and areas for improvement, which absolutely makes sense because they're starting a national tour and they've barely just started. You know, it's a new production that has a lot of different components, a lot of magic to it, and those things require a lot of fine tuning. So for it to be as polished as it was on its second tour stop was very impressive to me. Now, I haven't seen the film in quite some time, but I am going to talk you through some of the changes that I noticed. And needless to say, there's going to be a fair few spoilers in this section, but nothing too spoiler heavy. If you don't want spoilers, skip ahead to the next title where I'll be talking about more spoiler free things. So in this version of the show, the children are not only evacuees from London, but they are also orphaned during the Blitz. I don't remember this being a feature of the film, I could be completely mistaken. After they're taken in by Eglantine Price, Angela Lansbury's character from the film, she is more descriptive about why she wants to use the particular spell she wants to use in order to help the war effort. It's really more vague in the film and it's this slightly strange moment where she's like, if I can levitate things, I can fight the Nazis. They go into more detail about that in the show. Generally, they lean a lot more into the darker side of the fact that it's set during World War II and these were children who were orphaned. Charlie's character especially, the oldest of the three children, who is now a little bit older than he was in the film. He is 13 rather than, I think he was 11 in the film, and he's also played by an adult actor. Very convincingly, but you can still tell there's an age difference. He definitely grapples with a lot of anxieties and discernibly PTSD from his experience at the beginning of the show. Otherwise, it's generally remarkably similar. All of the songs from the film have made it into the show, including some cut songs from the film have actually been put back in for the show and the way that the score has been expanded, it very much sounds at home with the other songs. It's all very convincing. It's a very full and complete score that sounds as if it has been written in one musical style. The new songs really work alongside the old ones. The magical island that they visit has a slightly different name just for comedic effect. Her cat that she has in the film does not exist in the stage show, R.I.P. the cat. What's his name? Was his name Constance Creepers? Constant Cravings? Was that, is that a Katie Lang song? I don't know what that is. She had a cat, she doesn't anymore. Let's, let's leave it there. When they go to the magical island with all of the animals, they don't play a football match, but they do still meet a lot of talking animals and it's very cleverly done how they do that. There is one really, really, really big change in the film that I am not going to tell you about because it is the whole ending, but the last 10 minutes of the show are very unexpected. And I will say that. And I feel like there's no way you could possibly guess what they actually end up doing with it. So you're welcome to go see for yourselves and have your minds blown. So Diane Pilkington is just phenomenal as Eglantine Price. From the minute her casting was announced, I thought, yes, that's brilliant. She has that charm. She has the vocals where she has the soprano range and the belting. And she does belt in this show. Let me tell you, it is a good score if they can get Diane Pilkington to do a legit belt. You know, she has that fairy tale, maternal, slightly aloof, magical Glinda quality. But at the same time, she has the wry sense of humor that we saw in Young Frankenstein. Such a versatile actress who brings so much magic to this show. When she sings The Age of Not Believing, it's just such a beautiful moment. Charles Brunton is also really endearing as Emilius Brown. He gives a great performance, very committed in terms of his physicality, very funny, amazing vocals. Really enjoyed him in that role. Connor O'Hara plays Charlie, the oldest of the three children, and he is really fantastic in this. He's great at playing younger. Essentially what he does is he as an adult performer cast younger so that he can sort of chaperone the actual child actors playing his siblings around the stage. The three of them play off each other 
really well, the child actors that we had at this performance. He really grounds the show in a lot of ways and is very much the heart of it and he deserves a huge amount of acclaim for this performance. It's a really confident performance, very Charlie Stemp in Half a Sixpence, that kind of exceptional debut performance that is really exciting to see. And the other one I want to shout out is Rob Madge, who does great things in the ensemble in the first act, but then gets an exceptional moment at the start of the second act, puppeteering a fish that is just hysterical. There's quite a lot of animal content in this show. You know, there's the animals that they meet that you see in the film. People get turned into rabbits quite a little bit, hence the merchandise I am currently wearing. And the way that they bring all of those animals to life on stage is so cleverly done, like warhorse level puppetry, but even more expressive, even more animated. I think it's the best animal puppetry I've ever seen in any stage production. Specifically Norton the fish, I have fallen completely in love with. I would, I would die for this fish. I'm not even exaggerating. This fish is one of my favorite things in the world. The Portobello Road sequence is very, very strong. And I say that really disliking this song from the film. I feel like that's a moment I'd always skip the whole scene really. I'm like, yeah, they're going to a street market. It's slightly sinister, Bruce Forsyth is there randomly. But it's a very dynamic sequence in the show, the way that they've rearranged the music, the way they've made it this compelling ensemble number. It's much warmer, it's much more welcoming, it's funnier, it's not as sinister. I really welcome the change to this song, especially how dynamic they've made the music. Very compelling scene. The whole start of the second act sequence as well, very strong, the way that they do the beautiful Briny Sea. Iconic song, but also sort of interpolating it into another scene as well, very cleverly done. But if I have to choose an absolute standout highlight moment of the show, and again, this is a light spoiler, it's the way they do the flying. Now, I don't think it's too much of a spoiler to say that they include flying in this show because it's a big part of the plot in the film. There's no getting around it. So one of this production's biggest assets is the fact that Jamie Harrison is on the creative team as the set and illusion designer. Now he worked on Harry Potter and the Cursed Child and if you've seen that show, you know the way they do the magic on that show is incredible. Just these stunning effects that you almost can't believe. The design of the illusions in this show I would say is very similar. The set design is heavily incorporated into how they make the magic happen convincingly. And it's a mixture of illusions where you can see what's happening and how they're making that happen, sort of in line with how the animals are being puppeteered, and illusions that you have no idea how are happening because they are so incredibly convincing. I'm not going to tell you what happens in the scene where Eglantine Price flies, but all I can tell you is that I was so convinced she wasn't going to fly because of various things, and then when she did, I was like, oh, okay, they're doing it one of two ways. And then something happens that suddenly everything I thought I knew about that scene has changed and is gone, and I had no idea what was happening, and I was in awe. I was like a child at this performance because it was just blowing my mind how they were making this flight happen. And I was studying it, and I was looking for spoilers because I'm the kind of person who likes to see the wires and work out what's happening. Could not work it out, I tell you. So your homework from me is to go and see this show and message me on social media to let me know how the hell they are doing this flying because it blows my mind completely. Cannot work it out. The theatre going experience was really lovely, really positive. I will say, check your tickets. I was sure it was starting at 7.30 and I had lots of time to eat my Nando's. Cut to me throwing spicy rice down my face at 6.55 outside the theatre in Canterbury because I only had five minutes, 7 p.m. curtain. They had some lovely merchandise in store. They had a few t-shirts. I decided to get this one because I thought it was very cute. Can you see it? It has a little bunny. Can you see the bunny? It's also one of those family shows that's going to have a lot of children in the audience. If this is something that's going to put you off potentially going to the theatre, I would advise going on a midweek evening earlier in the week and avoiding the matinees, the Friday nights, those sorts of performances. So having said what I just did, I do recommend anyone with kids take them to this show. It's a lovely first experience of musicals at a theatre, I think. Just the magic of it all, seeing child characters represented on stage, the animals, there is so much for young children to enjoy and just fall in love with here, like I did as a young child watching this film. The magic of that film is so present in this stage adaptation. The heart of it is so there. I think it's a beautiful production that's going to absolutely it just entrance young viewers. It's great for families. There's lots for adults to enjoy. It's just a very well-written show. It absolutely does not pander to a young audience. It, you know, it has everything there. It's actually incredibly sophisticated. Really the stagecraft and how it's been put together and how this narrative has been structured 
it's really very seriously done. It's a very legitimate piece of theater that happens to be a beautiful family ready story. Any Disney fans, you're going to want to see this. It hits you right in the nostalgia. Any fans of the film, run to this, buy a ticket. It's a lovely one to take your parents to. It's just this perfect family friendly, lovely show. Wherever it is over Christmas, I'm sure that's gonna be a guaranteed brilliant time. Honestly, I cannot recommend this enough. For anyone particularly keen to support LGBTQ plus performers in theatre, there are a bunch of them in this show, including some great representation of trans and non-binary performers, which is quite rare. I could say so many lovely things about this show. Honestly, you just need to go see it for yourselves thank me later. And that is my review of Bedknobs and Broomsticks the musical. If it wasn't clear, I have completely fallen in love with this production. I will definitely be seeing it again. And after a very successful national tour, I really hope that it's able to come and do a run in London. I want as many people to see this as possible. I want to cast recording. I want to know how they do the damn magic. And I desperately need to see it again. And I want to interview Norton the Fish, putting that out there into the musical. I want to meet Norton. That will make my life, please. Norton, if you're watching, thank you so much for watching today's video. I I hope you enjoyed. If you did, make sure to subscribe to my staging YouTube channel for plenty more content about all your favorite shows coming very soon. Also, if you want to support me as a stagey content creator, head over to patreon.com forward slash Theatre where you can gain access to all sorts of exclusive photo and video content. If there are any shows you would like for me to review that I haven't already on my channel, drop it down in the comment section down below. Let me know on Instagram or social media or head over to my Patreon and you can get the chance to recommend videos on there as well. I hope that everyone is staying safe and that you have a stagey day. For 10 more seconds, I'm Mickey Joe Theatre. Oh my god, hey, thanks for watching, have a stagey day. Subscribe!